I would like to thank the Vanderbilt uh, University Department of Otolaryngology, uh, Division of Otology faculty for inviting me to present today on transcanal acoustic neuroma surgery. Uh, my name is Brandon Isaacson. I'm a professor of otolaryngology and neurosurgery at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And uh, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll have a better appreciation and understanding of this approach and the uh, indications for uh, transcanal acoustic neuroma surgery. Um, so first of all, um, this is just a general overview of, of, of minimally invasive uh, um, uh, lateral skull based surgery. And so I first initially wanted to go over what are some indications and contraindications. And then uh, I have listed here the various types of pathologies that can be uh, potentially addressed through a minimally invasive approach. Uh, at the end, I'll go through some lessons learned and tips that I've kind of, uh, I have developed um, and learned about as uh, uh, during this uh, journey of trying to uh, use more minimally invasive approaches. This is an interesting photo here demonstrating um, a patient, a pediatric patient who had a uh, extensive middle ear cholesteatoma. And this is actually the endosteum of the basal turn of the cochlea with the spiral uh, ligament that's been torn basically, um, or is open. Um, so interesting case, and you can see the view you get from this. So first of all, what are, what are some indications and contraindications for uh, using a transcanal approach? Um, well, indications uh, you know, are, are listed here, including uh, ear canal and middle ear lesions, petrous apex lesions, otic capsule lesions, uh, intracanalicular lesions, and then suprageniculate fossa. Um, things that are probably best approached through an, uh, using an open, but the more traditional open approaches would be uh, uh, lesions that involve the mastoid or just, you can, while you can address them by doing a, essentially an inside out or a bondy mastoidectomy using a transcanal approach, are, are probably more efficiently addressed through a tr traditional transtemporal or postauricular approach. Uh, lesions that are very vascular um, are a relative contraindication. I, I have we our center as well as a number of other centers, including Vanderbilt, have uh, have uh, successfully addressed um, paragangliomas and other uh, vasco middle ear lesions using a, a transcanal approach. But these certainly are more challenging and not something you should take on as your first case, first few cases. And then cerebral pontine angle extension is, in my mind, a, 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 a contraindication for using a minimally invasive approach. Um, this you know, MRI demonstrates a, a vestibular schwannoma that's medium sized, but has a fairly large contact surface with the brainstem. And um, at least in my mind, um, approaching this through a, a transplant approach really does not allow you adequate control of uh, the, the pica or the ica. Um, and potentially the vertebral arteries and, uh, and the various veins that traverse the cerebellum ponce angle. And so your ability to control those uh, situation with one of those structures is very limited with the transcanal approach. And I, I do not usually, uh, I do not consider these as uh, transcanal favorable for a transcanal approach. So uh, this is a nice overview slide of of what this approach entails. Uh, this is actually from uh, Daniele Marchione's Trilogic Thesis, which is published in Orange in 2015. Uh, and the outlined orange portion of this coronal CT demonstrates that essentially what you're doing is you're going through the promontory, through the basal turn of the cochlea uh, to expose the fundus as well as the entire internal auditory canal. Um, and this is a very nice illustration by uh, Dr. Marchione, who's an excellent artist, uh, again, showing this approach. And again, the borders on this approach are the petrous carotid artery. Um, the superior border is going to be your tympanic facial nerve. And it doesn't show the other two borders, which are the vertical segment of the facial nerve and the jugular bulb. Um, and this is just showing the position of the uh, intracanalicular contents uh, kind of uh, shadowed out, essentially, uh, or shadowed um, through a view through the cochlea. So um, this is kind of a modification that, that I uh, employed for my transcanal approaches uh, for at least for, uh, for the transprom approach. Uh, my first, uh, uh, for my opinion, these, because these are, you know, a, a CSF, a potential for a significant CSF leak and you're you going through the cochlea, then uh, preserving the ear canal and middle ear structures are just not, a, are not in the cards. And so I figured doing this modified Rambo technique was a more efficient way of uh, and, and provided more enhanced access to the uh, 
entire external auditory canal and the uh, middle ear. And so what this approach entails is this is a laterally based tragal skin flap. This is a, a left ear that you're looking at, or I'm sorry, a right ear that you're looking at. And so this is uh, the, the uh, cartilage surface of the tragal skin that's been elevated from medial to lateral and is still pedicled on the tragal tip essentially. And so when, once you've elevated this, then you remove the posterior membranous canal skin over the contral cartilage all the way down to the bony cartilage junction. And then you remove the main remaining ear canal skin, including tympanic membrane. And at the once that, with that, you have excellent access. You put, you put a, a skin hook in this to retract it or a suture to retract it out of the way. You wanna make sure to keep this flat moist throughout the case or covering it with a wet uh, four by four sponge uh, to prevent it from desiccating and drying out and contracting. Uh, but this allows you excellent access. And at the end of the case, uh, we, I typically close with the, close this with the 4 um, chromic suture using a horizontal mattress technique to provide a watertight closure. And this is a, um, I prefer, much prefer this over the um, typical overclosure, suture overclosure of the canal because you have to elevate the skin off the cartilage circumferentially from the, the medial side of the ear. You can do it through the lat through a lateral transcanal approach too, but I, but I find this much more difficult. And uh, this, I learned this flat from my, one of my, from our, prior chairman, Dr. Peter Rowland, um, and this was published a number of years ago. Um, but it's a, a nice way to address pathology where, um, where the hearing has already been uh, lost. Um, and again, this is a modified Rambo approach. So what is the uh, more detailed anatomy of the transpromatorial approach? Um, what you have here is, um, this is a, a, a right ear, and you have your lateral semicircular canal right, right here. You have your a tympanic facial nerve with second genu, and then the vertical segment of the facial nerve. Inferiorly, you'll have the jugular bulb. This bulb is low, so you don't really see it that well. And then you have your vertical uh, petrous carotid artery going to the genu of the uh, petrous carotid artery. And then your eustachian tube is right here. This is middle fossa dura going right above the genicular ganglion. And this is after all the promontory has essentially been removed, as well as the vestibule and the oval window has been opened. And what you're seeing here is the, this is the internal auditory canal this is the porous acousticus medially here and into the cerebellum pontine angle. And you see your eighth cranial nerve. The individual branches have already been severed on this cadaver specimen. Uh, but then you see your meatal segment of your facial nerve, labyrinthine segment, and then geniculate, tympanic, and again, vertical segment. Uh, the only portion of the cochlea that remains is this right here. This is the ascending portion of the basal turn of the cochlea. And so for tumors that are lateral, and I'll go into this in more detail, tumors that are very lateral and abut the fundus, you're going to have to open the entire cochlea. There have been some reports of doing cochlear implantation concurrently with this approach, but I think if you have a fundal tumor, that's gonna be really difficult to get complete exposure of your facial nerve for dissecting the tumor off without um, opening this, this uh, opening, removing of the, essentially the entire middle and apical turn. So this would really not allow you to do a cochlear implant. You can see here, there's really no, there's no cochlear nerve left. And so again, I think doing, trying to do a cochlear implant in these cases is probably, is, is not, not likely to achieve a, a, a good result given how much the, the structure of the cochlea you completely destroyed. So this is one example. Uh, this is an endoscopic approach. Um, and I'm gonna go further into detail about when I use an endoscope and when I use a microscope for these cases. This patient had an intracochlear and intravestibular tumor essentially, and had uh, significant vertigo and elected to have their tumor uh, removed via this approach. Uh, she had Meniere's-like symptoms that, that were just intractable to anything, um, medications, genomycin, uh, and so we elected to perform this approach endoscopically. So what we're doing here is, uh, in this case, we're not, we're going to do a traditional tympanometa flap. Uh, this is just showing making canal incisions, um, and this is a standard tympano flap. We're using a little suction round knife here to develop this flap, and we're, we're actually not going to close this ear canal off. We're going to do this entirely uh, via just a, a simple transcanal approach. So once the flap is elevated, we're going to expose the malleus. You can see the corded tympanic nerve right here. This is the anterior malleolar ligament. Um, and then we're going to cut the malleus just below the lateral, inferior to the lateral process. Um, and again, this patient has profound hearing loss. And we're gonna leave the malleus handle with the uh, tympanic membrane and we're gonna take out the lateral chain. So the incus is gone. We're going to do some additional curetting here to remove some bone and provide further access. And then we're going to remove the stapes here. You can see we're in the oval window. You actually can start seeing tumor within the vestibule here. And then we're going to remove the malleus. 
Okay. So this is just going to further improve our exposure. You can see the quarter tympanum nerve is right here. And so you can see that this is the uh, oval window. The vestibule has been removed. And here's some tumor that you're already encountering in the vestibule. So we'll just use some micro instrument, um, a little right angle hook here and a little um, joint knife to kind of further dissect this tumor out of the vestibule. And again, this is coming out relatively easily with minimal effort. Um, and with this approach, again, we're using an endoscope instead of a microscope. So all this is done with just one hand. The camera, your left hand is holding the camera. I'm a right-handed surgeon. So uh, the, my camera is being held with my left hand and all the instrumentation is being done with my right hand. And here, again, this is delivery of that intravestibular portion of the tumor. So now we're just taking the drill here and we're going to open up the cochlea. We're gonna start by connecting the round window up with the oval window. And then you already start seeing tumor here in the inferior, proximal inferior basal turn. And we're just gonna follow that inferior basal turn around uh, all the way up to the ascending turn. So now you're starting to see the junction between the inferior basal turn and the ascending basal turn. And this is all tumor within the, um, uh, within the scala tympani of the uh, uh, inferior and ascending basal turn. So again, we're gonna further open this up. Our tympanal flap again is up against the anterior canal wall. This is gonna allow us to further expose this tumor. Um, and I did discuss with this patient preoperatively about potentially putting in a cochlear implant at the same time. Uh, she was really just interested in getting her vertigo under control and um, did not wanna proceed with this. So I'm just removing a little bit more bone here. You can see into the vestibule, you can see there's the, I'm gonna pause this for a second. This right here, this little white structure is the opening of the, is the endolymphatic duct. So that's the uh, posterior semicircular canal that you're seeing right here. Or actually, that's the common cruise that you're seeing right here. And again, this is the endolymphatic duct that goes along the medial wall of the common cruise. That's going to be the um, ampulated into the posterior canal that you're seeing there. So this is an intra-vestibular view with the endoscope. So here, I'm just removing all the neuroepithelial elements. This is the cupula of the uh, posterior semicircular canal ampulated end. Uh, that's going to come out relatively easily. That may be a little bit of remnant tumor in there as well. Um, this is just a, um, I believe a crab tree dissector that we're using to remove that. Okay. And then once that's been completed, I'm just gonna further up the vestibule to make sure that we don't have any tumor or remnants left behind. Looks like there was a little bit up here, kind of along the uh, ampulated ends of the lateral and superior semicircular canal. This is also could just be a little bit of membranous labyrinth remnants, but I wanted to be sure that we essentially did a complete labyrinthectomy on this patient uh, by removing all the functional neural elements of the uh, inner ear, or at least the vestibular portion of the inner ear. Okay. So done all that, we'll clean this up here. And then um, again, just inspecting one more time, you can see one of the uh, openings of the labyrinth there, that's maybe the superior canal, um, uh, ampulated in, and we're going to just put some a little bit of genomycin soaked uh, gel foam in the vestibule um, just to further um, uh, promote uh, ablation uh, to prevent her episodic vertigo attacks. And then we're just going to put the tympanoma flat back in place and we're done. And uh, uh, this patient actually had significant vertigo right after surgery, as you would typically expect with a labyrinthectomy. Um, but ultimately, she's been completely vertigo-free since her surgery and uh, has been able to resume her life. So this is a perfect indication for uh, an endoscopic uh, transpromontorial approach. There's no, there's not a lot of drilling that's required, um, and and this was, this uh, patient was quite satisfied with uh, this approach. This next approach, this was a, a slightly larger tumor, um, and we uh, uh, probably about during my second or third case of of doing these, I realized that doing an endoscopic approach was just uh, very difficult to remove the, remove the amount of bone that you needed to remove with one hand and using irrigation and suction at the same time. And, and so we elected to switch over and use a microscope for these cases. And this tumor did have some CP angle extension. It was a little bit more difficult to do. This is that same uh, anatomy slide that I showed you before uh, that shows the anatomy of the transparent approach. It's just uh, inverted. So it shows a, a, a left ear. Um, so again, carotid you know, So now well, this is the modified Rambo flap. This is again, a left ear. We're making two incisions at six and 12 o'clock. And then we're going to transect the canal skin, uh, 
We're gonna start by dissecting the canal skin off the tragus. We're gonna detach it medially, and then we can elevate it laterally. So there's that tragal skin flap, flap that's laterally based. You gotta be really careful doing this so you don't buttonhole the skin because otherwise you can get a CSF leak. Now we've made a um, incision, a semicircular incision going across the conchal cartilage. And then we're gonna move all the membranous canal skin down to the bony cartilage's junction. So all we have left of the membranous canal skin, sorry, is, um, is really just the tracheal skin flap. So now I'm gonna remove the medial canal skin. There's still a little bit of membranous canal skin. I'm using a monopolar at relatively low settings to identify the bony meatus. And then we're going to progressively dissect all the canal skin out uh, from a medial to lateral fashion. We have to debulk some of this just to give us some more room. And uh, again, this patient's completely deaf and uh, wanted to remove this using a trans canal approach. So now um, important part of this procedure is doing a wide canal plasty. So here uh, we've uh, done that. We're going ahead and removing the lateral chain here. Again, this patient has no hearing. One of the disadvantages of this approach is that you do have to remove the corda uh, with, uh, with doing a trans prime approach. And this is just showing you the setup of the ear. So there's the stapes uh, with the black arrow, the green arrow showing the tympanic facial nerve. And now what we're doing is skeletonizing the facial nerve from second genu to vertical segment. This is a bigger tumor, so I wanna maximize everything I can. We're gonna go ahead and remove the stapes foot plate and open up the vestibule. And then we're gonna go ahead and connect the round window up to the oval window. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. You can see the actual basilar membrane right there uh, through this view. And then we're just gonna extend this all the way around. So um, again, here's our cochlear basal turn. This is part of the middle turn right here. Uh, and this is kind of the original um, uh, round window. So now we're just gonna follow this. This is a inferior basal turn right here. You can see the venous drainage pathway, the cochlea. And then we're up to the ascending turn right here. And then that's a little bit of fundus right there. So um, you can see that that's, that's the fundus of the internal auditory canal. We have our tympanic facial nerve medially here. And this is, uh, we're already looking at internal auditory canal. So here's the vestibule. Again, this is tumor at the fundus. And we're gonna open this bone up between the uh, fundus and the oval window. Now, ascending basal turn is right here. Again, tympanic facial nerve is up here. And then this is the fundus, the anterior portion of the fundus of the internal artery canal. This is ascending basal turn now that we're continually to open. Um, and now I'm elevating the tensor tympany muscle out of the canal. This is a good minute, allows you to get a little bit more, open, more exposure uh, so you can complete your cochleectomy. Uh, and again, we're going all the way down to that ascending basal turn. So again, fundus of canal, carotid arteries right here, jugular bulbs right here. Again, this is internal auditory canal fundus. So now we're gonna open up all this bone along the inferior aspect of the internal auditory canal, all the way down to the porous acousticus. And again, because I'm using a microscope, I have two hands and using that Rambo approach, I'm able to do this exposure. So this is internal canal. This is the tumor on the inferior surface after the bone's been removed. And that's the dura of the porous acousticus going into the cerebellum pontian angle. So we're gonna to continue to open that. And now we're gonna just start removing some of this bone of the canal um, and decompressing the IAC. So this is all eyes, internal auditory canal. I'm trying to open up more of the posterior, superior aspect of the internal canal. You will not be able to open the, um, the superior portion of the IAC because the fake tympanic fiction is gonna be right there. So you can't do that. So this is just removing more bone around the porous. And now I'm removing a little bit more bone over the fundus to try to get exposure of the uh, labyrinthine facial nerve. You can see here, green arrow, this is in a great view, but that's the tympanic facial nerve. This is cochlear nerve, and this is all tumor right here. Okay, and so now we're using nerve integrity probe to not only dissect, but map out the facial nerve. Facial nerve is anterior right here, it's this right here. We actually can get a traditional bipolar through this Rambo approach uh, to provide hemostasis. Um, and again, this is a facial nerve right there. And we're just slowly dissecting this out. This is, you're actually look, almost able to see into the cerebellum pons angle. And we're gonna do our traditional tumor debulking to make this uh, tumor into a smaller tumor. You can see the pons with the blue arrow, the green arrows, the facial nerve, almost at the porous acousticus. And then the black arrow is the actual tumor. So we're gonna further dissect this medially um, with this dissection tool, uh, being uh, cautious about any uh, posterior fossa vasculature. Uh, again, this, again, with two hands, this is a much easier procedure than trying to do this with one hand. 
obviously. And so now again, further debulking the CPA component of the tumor. Again, this is one of the largest tumors I've removed with this approach. And, um, and it was challenging, but it was definitely doable. But again, probably, I, I, I think every, almost everybody would argue that doing a trans lab approach is, is, is the safer way to go. Um, we did have adequate, um, we did have adequate ability to get the bipolar in here and do a dissection. You can see the end of the eighth nerve near, eighth nerve is uh, cut right there. And this is just some surgical cell for hemostasis. Now I'm just stripping the mucosa of the pro tympanum. And then we're going to, I'm going to roll in the rest of the tensor tympany muscle down the eustachian tube. And then we're going to pack that off really carefully. So we use some muscle and then I'm just using some bone wax to really uh, push in the rest of that tissue there. Next, we're going to use some fat and we're going to plug off the uh, internal auditory canal. And then we fill the entire middle ear and ear canal with some fat. And then we're going to close this rainbow flap using a modified, uh, using a horizontal mattress suture. And I'm using 4 chromic here. And that's the closure. It doesn't look great right now. Never does right after surgery. But this is uh, the post-op uh, um, CT scan showing the approach, um, both in the axial and coronal planes. You can see the carotid in red here. Um, the eustachian tube is right there, facial nerves right here, and this is the uh, dissection pathway that we used. And this is after she's healed up over a year, no evidence of recurrent tumor, and that's what the overclosure looks like. She had a gauge piercing here, so that's why her earlobe looks a little strange. Okay. So this is another patient. This is, uh, I think, uh, like six months after surgery. That's a complete closure, or maybe that may be actually two months after surgery. That's her Rambo overclosure. It looks great. You really, the tragus kind of almost hides a lot of the incision unless you look really closely. So our series, um, this is, I, I think I've done um, a couple more of these. So we've done 12 of them now. And uh, almost all of our pathologies were vestibular schwannomas. There was one patient who had a, a cochlear schwannoma um, that was in the vest, in the cochlea and extended all the way out to the IEC. Um, but most of these were vestibular schwannomas. We had one cavernous hemangioma. And again, the one video I just showed you here was that intracochlear schwannoma. Um, these are the relative tumor sizes and tumor volumes and then the ages of the patient, basically. And the uh, indications for this were patients who um, had tumors that were actually growing or the patient just had a personal preference to remove the tumor. Most of these tumors were actually growing tumors, which, and again, I know it's not, not typical of intracanalicular tumors, but, um, um, but uh, again, these most of them were, were uh, growing tumors. Um, just a further summary, uh, preoperative and postoperative facial nerve function. Um, all the patients had uh, normal function preoperatively, except for one. This patient had actually more of a grade three, uh, kind of a grade two, grade three Hospracklin scale preoperatively and had bad hemifacial spasm. They woke up with, uh, with severe weakness after the surgery and then recovered to a grade two, which was the preoperative status. Had another patient who had some weakness immediately after surgery, but again, recovered to grade one. All of them have had gross total excisions. Uh, we had two CSF leaks, um, both of which uh, occurred relatively uh, quickly right after surgery uh, and, and required some revision closures. Um, uh, most of them have had extended follow-up, uh, some up to two years. Um, and length of hospital stay, this patient was extended because again, they had a CSF leak, but the rest of them were all under five days. And then OR time initially was really long for these cases. Again, for an intracalicular tumor, that's ridiculously long. But then as we switched over to the microscope around this case, um, you can see the operative times are much shorter. I mean, this, the one we did through the canal, that intracochlear tumor was less than, was a little more than two hours. And so now with even a, you know, a tumor that fills the internal canal, we're normally, when you're starting the case by eight and we're, we're closing by noon. So these have been pretty, uh, our times have increased with our experience. And again, this just shows that operative time and case order. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the number of cases and their operative time, which isn't that surprising. Um, so what are some lessons I learned? Again, I think for CPA extension, I think this is probably not the most ideal approach. We did have a patient who we used this approach on back in December. Um, the case went great. Uh, there was a little bleeding at the end that we had to use a little bipolar. It was a little vessel that looked like maybe a, a labyrinthine artery, but it turned out it was a, yeah, it must have been a small ICA, but it ended up with a distal ICA infarct. They were really not minimally symptomatic from it if completely recovered. But again, that you, you would much more likely get better control of that using a traditional trans lab or retrosigmoid approach. Uh, you want to know your jugular bulb anatomy. If you have a really high jugular bulb, this is not a good approach to use because you won't be able to expose really a, much of the inferior aspect of the internal canal, which is what you're essentially exposing um, with this approach. So a high jugular bulb is a, that a butzer is really close to the IEC is not a good case, not a good use for this approach. 
You want to make sure you do wide canal plasty. That sometimes includes, includes exposing some of the glenoid fossa. I try to preserve the periosteum if I do that, and even the mastoid air cells. Again, it doesn't matter. You're packing off the eustachian tube and you're plugging up the entire internal canal with a fat graft. So it, these are, th this is not a problem to do this, and it actually helps your exposure. Uh, and then you want to expose the labyrinthine facial nerve for lateral tumors, and that requires removing the middle napal quaternion of the cochlea. So doing a cochlear implant with this approach is really not feasible. If you have someone who's a good candidate who maybe has a, a, a proximal or mid inter, intracanalicular tumor um, and you want to try to do a cochlear implant at the same time as the surgery, I think this is best done with the transive approach um, and saving the cochlear nerve anatomically, hopefully physiologically, and doing an implant via the transive approach. Um, you want to strip the protein pan at mucosa. I think both the leaks that we had, we didn't do a great job of that. And so I didn't think that allowed the, flat, the, the fat grafts and muscle grafts that we put down your station tube to adhere as well with all this mucosa still there. And then you really wanna be meticulous with what your Rambo flap closure technique. If you don't do a good job with this, you're certainly more likely to get a leak. And so this, again, be very diligent about that. Tips, you know, just in general for endoscopic ear surgery, you really wanna start with some simple case. This is just kind of, this lecture is really meant to demonstrate kind of what are the limits of this approach. And, and even then I have some concerns about using the transpile approach for, you know, because again, now we have potentially an option of implanting these patients for single-sided deafness, you know, either leaving the tumor in place or removing the tumor at the same time. And this approach really doesn't allow you to do that. Um, you really want to discuss that you may need to open the open, uh, do a traditional approach for these patients if you're going to use the transpile approach. Um, I don't, I don't think you should ever promise that you can do the case 100% of the time endoscopically. That's just not realistic. Uh, preoperative imaging is critical. Having uh, really a good idea where the jugular bulb is, as I mentioned before, in the carotid artery, and make sure the approach is actually feasible. And again, I do all these cases now other than intracochlear tumors with the microscope. Um, I just think it's much more efficient for bone removal. And then you want to have the correct instruments. There's a few special endoscopic ear spirit instruments which make this much easier. You can use, obviously, the instruments with the microscope as well. Um, I think that's important. And then have a plan for hemostasis. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer them at this point. Thank you.